Well, good evening to you, and as always, a very warm welcome to you to our worship of God here this Sunday evening. Delight to have you with us here in the building as we gather together the essence of God's people. We are a congregation of people who do gather thus together to bring our praise to God, and in so gathering together, we're bearing witness to what it is that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. He has brought us together, we who were separate, separate from one another, separate from God, and he brings us together. And we rejoice in that and in the prospect of where that will lead us. We're delighted to welcome you as well as you share with us online tonight and uh, wherever it is that you are as you share with us. Um, that is indeed the prospect that we have. The day will come when we unite together as a vast multitude that none can number to bring our praise to God. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. Come then as the people of God and let's unite then in the worship of God and sound out his praise in the song, Come People of the Risen King. And join in prayer together. Let us all pray. And our Father, whatever our circumstances are this evening, we consciously, intentionally direct our hearts to rejoice in those circumstances, those truths that are unchanging as we fix our eyes upon yourself. So that for all the confusion, all the turmoil in the world at large and in the world of our own lives, we're glad in the knowledge that you remain the sovereign God by whom all things were made. You are our creator, you are our savior, you are our father in and through your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. You have brought us into your family, you have pledged your love to us, you have committed yourself to us through time and through eternity and undertaken that there shall be no circumstance that comes our way, no trial, no adversity, no pain, no sorrow, no suffering, nothing 
that will afflict us, that will ultimately harm us, and nothing that will redirect your love for us away from us. How glad we are, our God and our Father, that the love that has laid hold of us in and through your Son is indeed constant and secure and utterly faithful. We bless you for that and rejoice in the knowledge that you are that great creator God who breathes and generates life into that which is dead and you cause that which is alive to grow. And we thank you, therefore, our Father, that the path on which you have set us, you declare, is indeed the path of life and that thereby, as we travel along that path, following your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, it is indeed like the first gleam of dawn and shines ever brighter, grows ever better until we reach that full day when we shall see you yourself in all your glory, in all your splendor, and shall be glad to unite with the whole company of your redeemed people from every nation and every generation in ascribing all honor and praise to you as the author of our salvation. And recognizing that it has all been by grace. It's not something that we have deserved at all, but you have done it all for us, our Father, and how glad we are. We don't deserve that, and yet you have been pleased to do it for us. And so we're glad to bring you our praise again this evening to come as we are, some struggling, some rejoicing, some at peace, some in turmoil, but coming all of us together, our gracious God, just as we are, to say, Lord, we're yours. We love you. We delight in you. We rely upon you. We look to you, and we rejoice indeed that your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, is risen, is ascended, is Lord, does have all that authority, and is indeed moving forward his purpose for our lives and for his world. Would you teach us? Would you bless us? Would you help us in our worship this evening that it may be pleasing, honoring to yourself, that it should serve to warm your heart as we open our hearts and give to you our minds and our ears and the affection uh, of our hearts all over again. Grant your help, Father, in this. We can only do that by the enabling grace of your Holy Spirit. Come, Spirit of God, and, and breathe upon us that we may indeed worship you with all our hearts tonight, and yours will be the glory for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to turn, as always at this point in our worship, to the, the Word of God to read the Scripture and uh, Richard is going to come. We've just started a series in, uh, up you come Richard, in 2 Timothy, and uh, we really didn't make much headway last week, but uh, we'll take it on from there. So Richard. This evening we continue in uh, Paul's second letter to Timothy, and we've got two readings uh, this evening. The first one, uh, chapter 1, and then the second in uh, chapter 3. So beginning at chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. On to chapter three and at uh, verse 10, Paul continues. You, however, know all about my teaching my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. What we were thinking about last week, what we'll carry on thinking about this week, is the, um, uh, the influence on Timothy of three individuals in particular. And a recognition that behind that, very often God does use the means of other people to uh, be the channel down which His grace flows into our lives, imparting life to us. And so I thought at this point in our worship, we may indeed rejoice together in uh, that long testimony, that long catalog of believers, um, some in our own experience and others way beyond uh, through whom God has been pleased to work so powerfully for all the saints who from their labors rest. Let's continue in our praise of God.
as we turn to the scriptures, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Before we start, let's again ask that the Lord himself would speak to all our hearts. Our Father, uh, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the instruction of your word. We thank you that it's more than simply something that informs our minds, but by the power of your Holy Spirit who authored it in the first place, you continue to use your word to transform our living, to transform our experience, to transform our fruitfulness in your service. And we bless you for that and Come, therefore, with that expectancy and yet with that reliance upon your Holy Spirit, that as we apply ourselves to your word tonight again, he would speak, he would give to us understanding, and he would seal that word to our hearts in such a way that it may do its good work in us. And we ask it all for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I suggested to you last week as we started in on 2 Timothy that in many ways the theme of the letter is that of life. You'll see in the opening statement that Paul makes there, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and keeping with or in accordance with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. That is a very, very basic theme that runs the whole way through the Bible God is the living God, not simply in the sense that, yeah, he's for real, but he is the living God and that he imparts and generates life. That's the essence of who he is and what he does. And therefore, the, the whole scripture from the account of creation uh, right through to the very end is the account of a God who is able from nothing to generate life in the first place. So uh, the man became a living being. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, right on through to the end of the Bible where we, we are given to see that the, the life that God affords to those who are dead in trespasses and sin is indeed a life that is marked by a brightness, a beauty, a vibrancy, and that gives expression to that growth uh, in our experience, our knowledge, so that uh, it does just keep on getting better and better and better and will do so all through eternity. You will never, ever get bored in eternity. It will just get better. And, and all the good things that there are in this life, as we reflect on them, they are simply a mirror that enables us to get some tiny glimpse of the glory and splendor of heaven itself. We've had family up with us this week, as some of you are aware. And uh, one of, the, one of the, the things that we, we pray for them is when they are up here, they would, they would get memories, good memories. And obviously when the sun shines as it shone this week, uh, those memories are somehow just enriched and expanded in terms of the places that they go, the things that they do, the experience that they have. And in many ways, all the memories that we have are, are ultimately memories of places, of people, and of pleasures. And in each regard, as we, we rehearse these memories, in every instance, they are simply pointing us forward to the, the glory and the wonder and the, the joy of heaven that is full of people, above all, the, the, the living God himself, but the whole family of God, people on the one hand, a place on the other too glorious, too lovely, too varied, too stupendous for even to be able to begin to glimpse what it is to be like and pleasure beyond all measure. And, and it is life that God means us to, to know. So Psalm 16 says that uh, the Lord has set us on the path of life. You've shown me the path of life. And that path is one that as we tread it does just get better and better. And uh, the life, therefore, that Paul is on about here as he speaks to Timothy is one in which he, he means that Timothy, who is now in the position of a pastor at the church in Ephesus, that he might understand the privilege and the responsibilities that are involved in generating that life in the experience of others. 
And, and that really is what this letter is written um, to ensure Paul late on in his life. He has seen the way in which through his ministry, God has imparted life to others. And now as he looks to that next generation of leaders in the church of God, his concern is that they should understand clearly how it is that they generate life, how it is that they are used by God to generate life in succeeding generations. And it's for that reason that in the opening five verses, Paul really pinpoints the three individuals who, above all others, were used by God to be the means of bringing this shy, retiring youngster by the name of Timothy into the enjoyment of that life of Christ um, that has seen him now as a pastor, something that he would never in a million years have countenanced as he grew up would never have imagined that he could be in such a position, exercising such a role, fulfilling such responsibilities. The man has come alive and has been given with the years that he has, given the scope to use his gifts, to use his time, use his energies in a way that will indeed impart life to others. And Paul, therefore, means to equip this man to tread on the heights, to live life in the heights. And therefore, he makes reference to the, the three individuals who have most profoundly been used by God to influence him. Paul himself, uh, we looked at him last week, and then these two others, his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. And, and he deliberately reminds Timothy of these individuals so that he might be able, as he reflects back on the impact that they have had, the influence that they have exercised, that he might understand from that the, the implications for him in terms of the sort of ministry that he, in his day and generation, will exercise. It's a, a varied ministry. And each of these individuals is different in some respects and exercises a slightly different ministry in Timothy's experience. So this evening, I hope that we will we'll be able to look at and think through, first of all, the sort of influence that Lois had, and then secondly, the sort of influence and role that Eunice had. And I should underline from the outset that um, this, this should not be applied by us in a gender-specific fashion, so that you may think, oh, Lois, I'm not a, I'm not a lady and I'm not a grandmother and Eunice, uh, I'm not a mother and I'm not a lady, so you know, half of you would be simply walking out the door and think this, this doesn't apply to me. It does. Um, the reference to, to Lois um, is a reference to one who is a grandmother. She's a, a member of the older generation by definition. And uh, whatever your marital state, whatever your domestic situation um, if that's you, you are an older member of the people of God, then, then this is application to you, and similarly with Eunice. So it's, um, it's not to be applied just in these uh, rather narrow ways, although it obviously does have application that way, but uh, it has that wider application for us all. Let me say just a little bit, first of all, about Lois. Uh, we um, don't know a lot about her, but the first thing that we perhaps need to be clear about is that she was what I've called a first-generation believer. Slight question mark about that because I couldn't absolutely 100% prove that to you, but, but all the indications are that she was a first-generation believer. And by that, um, we are to understand that this was a lady who took that bold step of faith um, that distinguished her from her peers, that set her apart from others in her family, from others in her neighborhood, but she took that step, which was a bold and a big step of entrusting her life to the Lord Jesus Christ and declaring in a Roman empire where the watchword for Roman citizenship and loyalty to the state was always Caesar is Lord. She took that bold step of saying Jesus is Lord. Lord. Costly, potentially, and a bold, bold step. And I think that one of the reasons why Paul mentions Lois here 
uh, to Timothy is because he recognizes that Timothy also is going to need to exercise a boldness that does not come naturally to him. And he wants Timothy to understand something of the, the, the way in which God has been pleased to use this older lady, Lois, in his life through the very boldness that she was prepared to exercise in her day and generation. And we do well, I suppose, to pause ourselves, particularly those who are older in years, those who are um, long-standing members of the church, and ask yourself, when you were last bold like that, has, has the exercise of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ lost that bold edge where you have settled for something rather more mediocre, something rather safer, where the, the choices that you make and the line that you pursue and the life that you live and the service that you render and the testimony that you bear has all the hallmarks of being safe. You play safe. And one of the things that Timothy would have been aware of about his grandmother was the boldness that had characterized her life. She had taken that bold step. And a younger generation today, as they grow up, and there are some of them with us in the building this evening, growing into teenage years and then growing through those teenage years into adulthood, they are going to need to be extremely bold. It is going to be a costly, a dangerous, and a courageous thing on their part to entrust their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and to live those lives for him. They're going to need to be bold. But if you, if you mean to, to launch them onto that pattern of life whereby their lives will indeed be lived for the praise and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, then you're going to need to encourage them and uh, quite literally encourage them. Give them that courage. And a large part of that will be by their seeing in you that you are bold, not foolish, in the sense of, of being blind to all the risks, but being ready to take those risks of faith that are representative of the obedience to the living God. Because um, right the way through the New Testament, it is evident that those who will serve God are going to require that boldness. You find that in the prayer that the early believers make in Acts chapter 4 when they're confronted by the hostility of essentially the state combined with the religious authorities, which is a, a wretched cocktail of power. And they simply come before the Lord and they ask God for boldness, grant us boldness. And even the Apostle Paul, and you'd think he had the brass neck of them all, even the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, when he's run through the, the armor of God and bid those folk uh, take on and put on the full armor of God. He is saying, and pray also for me. And what he's asking that they pray for twice over is that the, the Lord would give him courage because even the apostle Paul needed courage when you think through all the circumstances through which he passed. You, you understand why he needed courage. And here was a lady who, in uh, a non-dramatic, non-heralded, and uh, unnarrated fashion, had demonstrated that boldness in her life and in her living, and had done so in such a way that encouraged Timothy himself to be bold in his life. When you think through the, the Old Testament and you, you think about, uh, for instance, Daniel and his friends, Hananiah and um, uh, his, his, uh, his other friends there in, in, in the book of Daniel that we're reading about, young teenagers in the land of Babylon and yet exercising that sort of boldness. And you do well to ask um, where that came from. And sure, it came from the Lord, but almost certainly it was ministered by the Lord to them through other believers, through that older generation, not least Jeremiah, 
whose life and whose ministry was characterized. And Jeremiah was a pretty timid sort of guy, basically, who, who shied away from all that God called him to, but who nonetheless took that bold step and enabled that next generation to be bold in a way that the people of God had never had to be bold in, in uh, centuries. Same would be true of Esther in uh, exile as well. Bold, bold living on the part of these young believers in a very difficult, very hostile environment. And uh, almost certainly they, they um, were enabled to enter into that sort of level of living because of the boldness that they have seen in their forebears as well. Now, Lois was, was like that. And, and that's the challenge, I think, particularly for the more long-standing members of Christ Church, because we do tend to settle into a, a regular pattern that is ultimately quite comfortable. That's, that's always the, the kind of gravitational pull in our lives, so that we, we live out our Christian lives without in any way compromising the truth of the gospel, but that edge of boldness whereby we were reluctant to take the bold step to, to speak in a particular context where, where we're aware that, that the, the reception that we get from what we say may not be a very comfortable reception at all. We, we're tempted there to keep our mouths shut and, and um, conclude that it's, it's maybe not the right moment for me to speak. Boldness, that's um, one facet of Lois. But alongside that, obviously, she was a grandmother. And, and I want to, to underline the importance of that that role, that ministry, that relationship, um, and, and to broaden it out to the sort of role that older members of the congregation are able to play in the experience of younger members as well, particularly the children and the teenagers as they grow up. Um, one of the things about that um, older generation, grandparents especially, is that basically they, they have been through the whole system. They have actually raised a family and it wasn't totally disastrous. And therefore, they, they have a, a measure of street cred with children growing up that parents, by definition, can't quite have. But grandparents, they've actually been through the whole process. They have raised their children in such a way that those children have become adults and now are raising their own children. And they therefore have um, run the course. They, they know what's involved. And there is, therefore, a particular relationship that those who are younger may have with those who are older. And the initiative, I think, in the life of a fellowship is, is obviously with the, the older uh, generation to, um, to familiarize themselves with the children, the youngsters growing up amongst us. In a bygone generation, um, we were familiar in our society with what we call the extended family. Some of you will be very familiar with that. Um, if you uh, were brought up on the Daily Express, then you would be familiar with Grandma Giles, for instance. We'll put her on the screen there. Um, Grandma Giles was just the kind of figurehead at the head of a, an extended family, the Giles family. And, and she exercised a significant influence, not always for, for good in her case, but uh, she was a pretty potent lady. And the same would be true within the, uh, the most famous family in Scotland, which is the Bruins, obviously, um, an extended family that stretches from Grandpa Brune right down to the, uh, the Bairn, and um, uh, all of them part of that family who, who kind of live their life together. And there was a, a, a great benefit in family life of there being these generations within the same household, under the same roof. And, and that ensured that children growing up had the benefit of not only their parents' wisdom and direction and care, but that of a wider family circle as well, whereby they were able to draw on the wisdom and the care and the time and the energies of grandparents and the wider family and sometimes great-grandparents as well. And whatever else the Bruins may teach us, they, they certainly underline the value of that. Now, the, the Church of Jesus Christ is in many ways the ultimate extended family. That's what it's meant to be. 
Um, it's not meant to be a, a body of believers, all of whom uh, fit into the same mold, all of whom are roughly the same sort of age, a church for, for young folk or a church for older folk. It's never meant to be like that. It is meant to be a composite body of all ages who are able themselves to exercise that fruitful ministry among them. And clearly, Lois, as a grandmother, as uh, part of that older generation, had fulfilled that sort of role. And um, I, I think that there is a, a particular responsibility and a particular privilege upon those who are uh, actually grandparents and those who are um, by, by um, proxy, as it were, within the life of the fellowship of God's people who are themselves grandparents to the younger generation. If you are familiar at all with the book of Ruth, then you will be aware that um, it ends in a rather striking way where the child that has been born to Ruth and to Boaz is, is given to Naomi and we, we read that uh, Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. And the women living there said, Naomi has a son. And I guess if you were Ruth, you'd be thinking, hey, hang on a minute. You know, I was the one that went through the, the labor that was involved in giving birth to this son. Naomi's had a son. Um, but that's the perspective. Here is the grandmother who has uh, the child in her arms and who cared for him. Um, not just in the sense of kind of um, soothing him, but, but there is something far more fulsome, far more expansive about that that will, will play into this young infant son's life down through the years that will shape the son in such a way that his son and his son beyond that, who will be David, the great king of Israel, owes his spiritual uh, spiritual strength and virility to the care of this woman, Naomi, who has been through the mill, who has suffered and struggled in, in all manner of ways. She, she has known what it is to be without food. She has known what it is to have to uproot. She has known what it is to go to a, a foreign land, live a, a different language, culture, and everything like that, who has experienced bereavement in her husband's dying and in her son's dying, uh, and has, has been through the mill in all sorts of ways. And yet, here is a woman who, through it all, has, has clung to the living God. And she takes this child, her grandchild, in her arms, and she cares for him. And the fruit of that care of her grandchild will indeed be seen most fully two generations beyond that, when she's long since dead and gone. But this is where it begins. And all that you read about David and the individual that he was, and the, the way in which from an early age, he was exercising that boldness, he was exercising that trust in the living God. It has in many ways its origins way back in the care that Naomi has as she holds her grandchild in that manner. And it's um, always been striking to me that in Luke's account, Luke of course is a doctor, but Luke's account of the birth of Jesus as he introduces the gospel and uh, the, the life and the ministry of Jesus. The focus in those opening two chapters, very long chapters, and the, the fullest account of the birth of Jesus, his coming into this world. The focus at the center of it is a young couple, Mary and Joseph, with this child, um, the very son of God who is entrusted to the care of two teenagers who have no experience of family life in terms of bringing up children themselves. No experience at all. They have little in the way of adult life experience either. And, and the narrative, the way that Luke's gospel is structured, the narrative that centers on the care that they are now to give to this, the very son of God as, as they bring him into this world and nurture him uh, as their son um, is bracketed, bookended by two older couples so that the, the account 
of the ministry of Jesus begins with an old couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, who are well advanced in years, which is a euphemism in the Bible for saying they were, they were really past it. They were, they were old and really old. That on the one hand, and then at the other end of this whole opening narrative in the first two chapters, Simeon and Anna, two elderly individuals. They weren't a couple as such, but they, uh, they are two individuals in Jerusalem. And in both cases, it is the older couple who provide uh, the, the young couple, Mary and Joseph, uh, newly entrusted with this daunting prospect of, of raising now the very son of God. How on earth are you going to do that? But they are supported by, bracketed by, upheld by the ministry that is exercised by Zechariah and Elizabeth on the one hand, practical help as Elizabeth goes to be with Mary through those, those months of pregnancy, talking her through it, working her through it, being there with her and helping her in very practical ways. Simeon and Anna at the other end as well, uh, there to encourage and to reassure and to, to bear their own witness, to, to take again, Simeon takes the child in his arms. And, and the ministry that he exercises as he takes this elderly saint of God, as he takes this child in his arms and, and blesses God for him, would be a huge encouragement to Mary and Joseph. And today, parents, as they raise their children, they need a huge amount of encouragement. Because raising your children for Jesus Christ today is a hugely demanding, challenging difficult, tortuous responsibility. How do you do it? With all that they're exposed to on the television and on the internet, where a multitude of other people very often and very easily have total access to your child. When what they get taught at school runs diametrically opposite to all that you want to, to teach them at home. How on earth do you raise your children. Please, please be sure that parents today need a huge amount of encouragement. They need a huge amount of prayer. They need a huge amount of support. And those who are up in years, um, they are best placed to afford that to them so that within the extended family that um, that leaves the bruins really in, in the shade in terms of the, uh, the, the, the brightness and the vibrancy and the, the benefit of that family life. Those who are up in years, those who are long-standing believers, those who are advanced in years are able to provide that sort of encouragement to them. Um, I would love if there was time to tell you about my own gran and the influence that she had on me and, and my mum and the influence that her grandfather had on him, the, the one letter that uh, she had retained through all her life until well on into her 80s when she died, that one letter that was there was a letter from her grandfather, which she'd received as a young teenager from him when he was up in years. And uh, he, had, he had simply, in a gracious but bold way, exhorted her to give her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and she clung to that letter because the, the authority with which it was spoken by the generation above her parents and a man who had demonstrated in his business life, in his family life, in the whole spectrum of his living, had demonstrated just what a difference it makes to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That, more than anything else, shaped my own mother. And, and to see that um, is, I think, to, to recognize the sort of role, therefore, that Timothy is being encouraged to exercise himself. Let me press on and say a little bit about Eunice as well. And uh, Paul very deliberately mentions Eunice here, his mother, as being influential in Timothy's life, hugely influential. Uh, we learn a little bit about her from Acts chapter 16. We learn that she was in a mixed marriage. And therefore, Timothy had grown up 
learning in his home how his mother handled living the life of faith in an environment where she did not get the support from those alongside her, which of course was increasingly what Timothy would be finding as pastor of a church in Ephesus. And some of the issues that he was going to face, some of the challenges that were going to be there for him as he ministered there in Ephesus, as the later parts of the letter make clear, were precisely these. How do you exercise that ministry, continue to live out the life of faith when you don't get the support from those closest to you? Um, in some ways, that's what chapter 4 in 2 Timothy uh, is, is highlighting. Now, Eunice had demonstrated that, the integrity of her faith um, inherited from her mother, but now to be lived out in the context of a mixed marriage, it would seem from Acts chapter 16. And <clears throat> it is important, therefore, to, to recognize that, that how you live out your life in a context that is akin to that. It may be in, in your work life that that's where these things are, are displayed, where you, you live out your life in uh, an environment that provides no support at all for that. I was chatting to our, our oldest son over these past days about um, the, the, the kind of scope of his training as one who's known that call of God to minister God's word. And, and we were just chatting about the, the part that was played in my training of the, the time spent as a believer working on farms up in the north of Scotland where um, the, the whole farm worker uh, body, none of them had any faith at all. And the whole set of values, their whole perspective was diametrically at odds with the Christian faith. How do, you, how do you live out the Christian faith when you are working in that sort of context, working in a fish shop where the ethics of the staff were, again, totally at odds with anything Christian at all? And where the, the perspective of the workforce upon the Christian faith was, was a very negative thing indeed. And learning to live out your life as a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ in that sort of context um, is, is something that clearly in Eunice's life had, had been enormously helpful to Timothy as he grew up. So although it, it may be a very difficult situation that you find yourself in, it may be the work context, it may be in your, your neighborhood, it may be in the, the, the block of flats where you live, it may be in your own home, your own family, that you, you are the only one really that uh, takes this particular stance in following the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever it is, don't for a moment think that somehow that's, that's um, just a sideline to all that the Lord calls you to be. It can be hugely, hugely important in terms of the means by which God generates life in others, not least those around you as they see what that life of faith looks like in contrast to the life that they see being lived by others around them. That's one thing about um, Eunice that we do well to note. A second thing that we do well to recognize is that she was what I've called a second generation believer. Uh, her mother was a believer and it would seem that she had herself come to that sort of faith uh, on account of her mother's prayerful instruction and encouragement. And there are challenges in that. There are enormous blessings in growing up in a Christian home, but there are challenges. And in some ways, the biggest challenge of being a second generation believer or a third generation believer or whatever for that matter is in ensuring that the, the same ardor, the same zeal, the same sense of wonder is indeed retained and maintained by you that uh, is the, the hallmark of those who have come uh, 
to newness of life in Jesus Christ as a first generation believer. It is a wonderful thing when your eyes are open. It is a glorious thing to know that the Lord is risen, that he is king, that he is at work, that he has changed your life, that he's brought you into a new world. There is that sense of wonder. There is that eagerness to apply yourself to the service of the living God. But, but when you've brought up on that, and it's just been in your blood, as it were, from day one, you've never known anything different. One of the, the tendencies that there can be is for that, that zeal to become diluted, for there to be a lack of that zeal, a lack of that wonder, a lack of that eagerness, excitement, enthusiasm in the living out of your life. And, and here is a, a second generation believer uh, in whom it would seem there had been that retention of that sense of wonder, that vibrancy of her faith. And um, the ministry that Eunice had exercised, we, we are given a clue about that in uh, the, the third chapter of Paul's letter here. Um, he, he speaks in, in the passage that Richard read earlier from verse 10. He speaks, first of all, about himself and the example that Timothy has been exposed to. Uh, you know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering, what kind of things happened to me, and the way in which he coped with them all. Uh, he's seen that. He's seen the way in which this guy lived through all that and persevered through all that and bore through that and the way in which God upheld and helped him through all that. And then he goes on to speak about Timothy and the background that he said, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have come, become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. And you may well ask, well, well, who's that? Is he talking about himself, that he learned it all from Timothy, uh, from Paul rather? And the answer is no, because uh, he goes straight on to verse 15, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And so he's reminding Timothy of those from whom he learned it. Um, those like his mother and his grandmother who taught him from infancy. Note that. You don't wait until a child is, is kind of um, uh, 10 or 11 and then you start um, you know, talking to them about these things. You teach them from infancy. And, and he's saying, and you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy they taught you, and they taught you in a way that was consistent with the manner in which they lived out their life. What they were teaching you, you were seeing in their lives. You were seeing that boldness. You were seeing that faithfulness of the living God. You were seeing the way in which God worked in their lives and through their lives. All that they were teaching you about the God who comes in Jesus Christ to save and to rescue, you've seen it in their lives. You, you know them. And have known that through all your growing years. And there was therefore the example that they afforded to Timothy in that manner. And again, it is important to, to recognize that the degree to which the example that is given of the good news of Jesus Christ in our lives the degree to which that example is, is the means God uses to, to drive home the truth of the gospel to those who are growing up. In other words, people, and a younger generation today especially, they need to see the gospel as well as hear it. They need to see what it looks like. They need to see that it is distinctive, that it is different, that it is vibrant, that it is marked by the power of the living God coming upon them. You get another clue as to what um, Eunice, the impact of her life in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 to 9, where Paul speaks of himself in these terms. He says, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Remember Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. What does that mean? A nursing mother. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. 
Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. I think what he's doing when he speaks to Timothy about Eunice is he is reminding Timothy of the way in which as a mother, Eunice had illustrated the gospel to him from his earliest days. How? Well, as a nursing mother, she gave him of her very self. That's the gospel. God gives of his very self to us. And moreover, he reminds Timothy of the way in which his mother Eunice um, I, I think that's the drift of what Paul is on about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 when he uses this illustration of a nursing mother. What, what do mothers like that, what do they do? They work and toil night and day for no recognition, no heralding, with all the, the, the nasty, messy jobs that need to be done. They do all of that. They work their socks off exhaust themselves in the process. They give of themselves in order that they may not be a burden to their children. And their children, as they grow up, might learn to understand that's what God is like. That's the gospel. God comes to take the burden from us and to do himself for us. But we simply can't do ourselves. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4. What other God is there who acts on behalf of those who wait for him? That's God. And, and that's a mother. And that's the gospel. And, and Timothy, as he grew up, was exposed not only to the teaching of the scriptures, but to the demonstration of the gospel. In some ways, I often think that the ministry that a mother makes is the most Christ-like ministry that any make. They give of themselves utterly, wholly, for their children. Work and toil day and night, exhausting themselves for little by way of gratitude often, Little by way of recognition, they're not looking for either. They do it out of love. And in that, they are demonstrating the grace of God in the gospel. And that's a profoundly important thing, to learn to live like that. That those uh, to whom Timothy is going to minister will be able to, to know life because they've seen it. They've seen what this God is like. Well, that's the, uh, the thrust of what Paul is on about here. Uh, he, he means that Timothy should indeed live life on the heights and be one through whom life is generated in others. And please, God, we shall ourselves learn to live like that. Let me pray. God, our Father, as we bow again before you this evening, we pause to thank you for those through whose living and through whose testimony and through whose instruction you have been pleased to impart life to ourselves. Thank you for those who have been our teachers and our mentors. Thank you, living God, for the ministry exercised within that wider extended family by an older generation for the love, the care, the encouragement, the time that they've given, the understanding that they've afforded, and the way in which they have displayed in their stamina, in their boldness, in their faithfulness, in their grace the great truths of the gospel. For those who have mothered us, birthed us, 
given of themselves in all the mundane practicalities of life, a million and one different small little things that have been done, tasks that have been fulfilled in which the Lord Jesus has been demonstrated. Thank you, Father, for all that you are. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you take the burden from us. Thank you that you act on our behalf, that you do the toil and the work, night and day, neither slumbering nor sleeping, but always watching over us. And we thank you for that. Would you be, Father, with those who are mothers and fathers, helping them in the responsibilities that they have? Would you be with those who are grandparents? Would you be with that wider uh, application of this to the older members of this fellowship? that they may indeed be able to recognize the ministries that you give to them. And may there be, Father, the raising up of a fresh generation who will indeed have that perspective, follow the Lord Jesus Christ gladly and eagerly, and will display amongst their peers from an early age that same boldness, that same winsomeness, that same grace that will be the means of their becoming in their turn life-giving to others. And this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, as our closing praise, let's join in the singing of the, the song, Lord, for the years. that eagerness to serve the Lord, that you may be a life giver to others. And to that end, let's join in saying together the words of the grace. We'll put them on the screen for you and uh, encompass one another with the grace and enabling of God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.